Part Four of The Prince by Niccolo Machiavelli, translated by W. K. Marriott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Clive Catterall. Chapters Nine to Twelve. Chapter Nine, concerning a civil principality. But coming to the other point, where a leading citizen becomes the prince of his country, not by wickedness or any intolerable violence but by the favour of his fellow-citizens. This may be called a civil principality. Nor is genius or fortune altogether necessary to attain to it, but rather a happy shrewdness. I say, then, that such a principality is obtained either by the favour of the people, or by the favour of the nobles, because in all cities these two distinct parties are found, and from this it arises that the people do not wish to be ruled nor oppressed by the nobles, and the nobles wish to rule and oppress the people. And from these two opposite desires there arises in cities one of three results, neither a principality, self-government, or anarchy. A principality is created either by the people or by the nobles, accordingly as one or other of them has the opportunity. For the nobles, seeing they cannot withstand the people, begin to cry up the reputation of one of themselves and they make him a prince, so that under his shadow they can give vent to their ambitions. The people, finding they cannot resist the nobles, also cry up the reputation of one of themselves, and make him a prince so as to be defended by his authority. He who obtains sovereignty by the assistance of the nobles maintains himself with more difficulty than he who comes to it by the aid of the people because the former finds himself with many around him who consider themselves his equals, and because of this he can neither rule nor manage them to his liking. But he who reaches sovereignty by popular favour finds himself alone, and has none around him, or few, who are not prepared to obey him. And besides this, one cannot, by fair dealing and without injury to others, satisfy the nobles, but you can satisfy the people for their object is more righteous than that of the nobles, the latter wishing to oppress, while the former only desire not to be oppressed. It is to be added also that a prince can never secure himself against a hostile people, because of their being too many, whilst from the nobles he can secure himself, as they are few in number. The worst that a prince may expect from a hostile people is to be abandoned by them, but from hostile nobles he has not only to fear abandonment, but also that they will rise against him. For they, being in these affairs more far-seeing and astute, always come forward in time to save themselves, and to obtain favours from him whom they expect to prevail. Further, the prince is compelled to live always with the same people, but he can do well without the same nobles, being able to make and unmake them daily and to give or take away authority when it pleases him. Therefore, to make this point clearer, I say that the nobles ought to be looked at mainly in two ways. That is to say, they either shape their course in such a way as binds them entirely to your fortune, or they do not. Those who so bind themselves and are not rapacious ought to be honoured and loved. Those who do not bind themselves may be dealt with in two ways. They may fail to do this through pusillanimity and a natural want of courage, in which case you ought to make use of them, especially those who are of good counsel, and thus, whilst in prosperity you honour them, in adversity you do not have to fear them. But when, for their own ambitious ends, they shun binding themselves, it is a token that they are giving more thought to themselves than to you and a prince ought to guard against such, and to fear them as if they were open enemies, because in adversity they will always help to ruin him. Therefore, one who becomes a prince through the favour of the people ought to keep them friendly, and this he can easily do, seeing that they only ask not to be oppressed by him. But one who, in opposition to the people, becomes a prince by the favour of the nobles, ought above everything to seek to win the people over to himself, and this he may easily do if he takes them under his protection. Because men, when they receive good from him of whom they were expecting evil, 
are bound more closely to their benefactor. Thus the people quickly become more devoted to him than if he had been raised to the principality by their favours. And the prince can win their affections in many ways, but as these vary according to the circumstances, one cannot give fixed rules, so I omit them. But, I repeat, it is necessary for a prince to have the people friendly, otherwise he has no security in adversity. Nabis, prince of the Spartans, sustained the attack of all Greece and of a victorious Roman army, and against them he defended his country and his government. And for the overcoming of this peril it was only necessary for him to make himself secure against a few. But this would not have been sufficient had the people been hostile. And do not let any one impugn this statement with the trite proverb that he who builds on the people builds on mud, for this is true when a private citizen makes a foundation there, and persuades himself that the people will free him when he is oppressed by his enemies, or by the magistrates, wherein he would find himself very often deceived, as happened to the Gracchi in Rome, and to Monsieur Giorgio Scali in Florence. But granted a prince who has established himself as above, who can command, and is a man of courage, undismayed in adversity, who does not fail in other qualifications, and who, by his resolution and energy, keeps the whole people encouraged. Such a one will never find himself deceived in them, and it will be shown that he has laid his foundations well. These principalities are liable to danger when they are passing from the civil to the absolute order of government, for such princes either rule personally or through magistrates. In the latter case their government is weaker and more insecure, because it rests entirely on the good will of those citizens who are raised to the magistracy, and who, especially in troubled times, can destroy the government with great ease, either by intrigue or open defiance. And the prince has not the chance amid tumults to exercise absolute authority, because the citizens and subjects, accustomed to receive orders from the magistrates, are not of a mind to obey him amid these confusions and there will always be in doubtful times a scarcity of men whom he can trust. For such a prince cannot rely upon what he observes in quiet times, when citizens have need of the state, because then every one agrees with him. They all promise, and when death is far distant they all wish to die for him. But in troubled times, when the state has need of its citizens, then he finds but few and so much the more is this experiment dangerous, inasmuch as it can only be tried once. Therefore, a wise prince ought to adopt such a course that his citizens will always in every sort and kind of circumstance have need of the state and of him, and then he will always find them faithful. CHAPTER X. CONCERNING THE WAY IN WHICH THE STRENGTH OF ALL PRINCIPALITIES OUGHT TO BE MEASURED. It is necessary to consider another point in examining the character of these principalities. That is, whether a prince has such power that, in case of need, he can support himself with his own resources, or whether he has always need of the assistance of others. And to make this quite clear, I say that I consider those who are able to support themselves by their own resources, who can either, by abundance of men or money, raise a sufficient army to join battle against any one who comes to attack them. And I consider those always to have need of others, who cannot show themselves against the enemy in the field, but are forced to defend themselves by sheltering behind walls. The first case has been discussed, but we will speak of it again, should it recur. In the second case one can say nothing except to encourage such princes to provision and fortify their towns and not on any account to defend the country. And whoever shall fortify his town well, and shall have managed the other concerns of his subjects in the ways stated above, and to be often repeated, will never be attacked without great caution. For men are always adverse to enterprises where difficulties can be seen, and it will be seen not to be an easy thing to attack one who has his town well fortified and is not hated by his people. The cities of Germany are absolutely free. They own but little country around them, and they yield obedience to the Emperor when it suits them. Nor do they fear this or any other power they may have near them, because they are fortified in such a way that every one thinks the taking of them by assault would be tedious and difficult. Seeing they have proper ditches and walls, they have sufficient artillery, 
and they always keep in public depots enough for one year's eating, drinking, and firing. And beyond this, to keep the people quiet, and without loss to the state, they always have the means of giving work to the community in those labours that are the life and strength of the city, and, on the pursuit of which, the people are supported. They also hold military exercises in repute, and, moreover, have many ordinances to uphold them. Therefore, a prince who has a strong city, and had not made himself odious, will not be attacked, or, if any one should attack, he will only be driven off with disgrace. Again, because that the affairs of this world are so changeable, it is almost impossible to keep an army a whole year in the field without being interfered with. And whoever should reply, if the people have property outside the city and see it burnt, they will not remain patient, and the long siege and self-interest will make them forget their prince. To this I answer that a powerful and courageous prince will overcome all such difficulties, by giving at one time hope to his subjects that the evil will not be for long, at another time fear of the cruelty of the enemy, then preserving himself adroitly from those subjects who seem to him to be too bold. Further, the enemy would naturally on his arrival at once burn and ruin the country at the time when the spirits of the people are still hot and ready for the defence and therefore so much the less ought the prince to hesitate, because after a time, when spirits have cooled, the damage is already done, the ills are incurred, and there is no longer any remedy, and therefore they are so much the more ready to unite with their prince, he appearing to be under obligations to them, now that their houses have been burnt and their possessions ruined in his defence. For it is the nature of men to be bound by the benefits they confer as much as by those they receive. Therefore, if everything is well considered, it will not be difficult for a wise prince to keep the minds of his citizens steadfast from first to last, when he does not fail to support and defend them. CHAPTER Eleven, CONCERNING ECCLESIASTICAL PRINCIPALITIES It only remains now to speak of ecclesiastical principalities, touching which all difficulties are prior to getting possession because they are acquired either by capacity or good fortune, and they can be held without either, for they are sustained by the ancient ordinances of religion, which are so all-powerful, and of such a character, that the principalities may be held no matter how their princes behave and live. These princes alone have states and do not defend them, and they have subjects and do not rule them, and the states, although unguarded, are not taken from them and the subjects, although not ruled, do not care, and they have neither the desire nor the ability to alienate themselves. Such principalities only are secure and happy. But, being upheld by powers to which the human mind cannot reach, I shall speak no more of them, because, being exalted and maintained by God, it would be the act of a presumptuous and rash man to discuss them. Uh, nevertheless, if any one should ask of me how it comes that the Church has attained such greatness in temporal power, seeing that from Alexander backwards the Italian potentates, not only those who have been called potentates, but every baron and lord through the smallest, have valued the temporal power very slightly, yet now a king of France trembles before it, and it has been able to drive him from Italy, and to ruin the Venetians. Although this may be very manifest, it does not appear to me superfluous to recall it in some measure to memory. Before Charles, King of France, passed into Italy, this country was under the dominion of the Pope, the Venetians, the King of Naples, the Duke of Milan, and the Florentines. These potentates had two principal anxieties. The one, that no foreigner should enter Italy under arms. The other, that none of themselves should seize more territory. Those about whom there was the most anxiety were the Pope and the Venetians. To restrain the Venetians, the union of all the others was necessary, as it was for the defence of Ferrara. And to keep down the Pope, they made use of the barons of Rome, who, being divided into two factions, Orsini and Colonnesi, had always a pretext for disorder. And standing with arms in their hands, under the eyes of the pontiff, kept the pontificate weak and powerless and although there might arise sometimes a courageous pope, such as Sixtus, 
yet neither fortune nor wisdom could rid him of these annoyances. And the short life of a pope is also a cause of weakness, for in the ten years which is the average life of a pope, he can with difficulty lower one of the factions, and if, so to speak, one pope should almost destroy the Colonnesi, another would arise hostile to the Orsini, who would support their opponents, and yet would not have time to ruin the Orsini. This was the reason why the temporal powers of the Pope were little esteemed in Italy. Alexander the Sixth arose afterwards, who, of all the pontiffs that have ever been, showed how a Pope, with both money and arms, was able to prevail. And through the instrumentality of the Duke Valentino, and by reason of the entry of the French, he brought about all those things which I have discussed above in the actions of the Duke. And although his intention was not to aggrandize the Church, but the Duke, nevertheless what he did contributed to the greatness of the Church, which, after his death and the ruin of the Duke, became the heir to all his labours. Pope Julius came afterwards and found the Church strong, possessing all the Romagna, the barons of Rome reduced to impotence, and, through the chastisements of Alexander, the factions wiped out. He also found the way open to accumulate money in a manner such as had never been practised before Alexander's time. Such things Julius not only followed, but improved upon. And he intended to gain Bologna, to ruin the Venetians, and to drive the French out of Italy. All of these enterprises prospered with him and so much the more to his credit, inasmuch as he did everything to strengthen the church, and not any private person. He kept also the Orsini and Colonnesi factions within the bounds in which he found them, and although there was among them some mind to make disturbance, nevertheless he held two things firm, the one the greatness of the church with which he terrified them, and the other not allowing them to have their own cardinals who caused the disorders among them. For whenever these factions have their cardinals, they do not remain quiet for long, because cardinals foster the factions in Rome and out of it, and the barons are compelled to support them, and thus from the ambitions of prelates arise disorders and tumults among the barons. For these reasons His Holiness Pope Leo found the pontificate most powerful, and it is to be hoped that, if others made it great in arms, he will make it still greater and more venerated by his goodness and infinite other virtues. CHAPTER Twelve, How many kinds of soldiery there are, and concerning mercenaries. Having discoursed particularly on the characteristics of such principalities as in the beginning I proposed to discuss, and having considered in some degree the causes of their being good or bad, and having shown the methods by which many have sought to acquire them and to hold them, it now remains for me to discuss generally the means of offence and defence which belong to each of them. We have seen how necessary it is for a prince to have his foundations well laid, otherwise it follows of necessity he will go to ruin. The chief foundation of all states, new as well as old or composite, are good laws and good arms. And as there cannot be good laws where the state is not well armed, it follows that where they are well armed, they have good laws. I shall leave the laws out of the discussion, and shall speak of the arms. I say, therefore, that the arms with which a prince defends his state are either his own, or they are mercenaries, auxiliaries, or mixed. Mercenaries and auxiliaries are useless and dangerous, and if one holds his state based on these arms, he will stand neither firm nor safe for they are disunited, ambitious, and without discipline, unfaithful, valiant before friends, cowardly before enemies. They have neither the fear of God nor fidelity to men, and destruction is deferred only so long as the attack is. For in peace one is robbed by them, and in war by the enemy. The fact is, they have no other attraction or reason for keeping the field than a trifle of stipend which is not sufficient to make them willing to die for you. They are ready enough to be your soldiers whilst you do not make war, but if war comes they take themselves off, or run from the foe. Which I should have little trouble to prove, for the ruin of Italy has been caused by nothing else than by resting all her hopes for many years on mercenaries, 
and although they formerly made some display, and appeared valiant amongst themselves, yet when the foreigners came they showed what they were. Thus it was that Charles, King of France, was allowed to seize Italy with chalk in hand, and he who told us that our sins were the cause of it, told the truth, but they were not the sins he imagined, but those which I have related. And as they were the sins of princes, it is the princes who have also suffered the penalty. I wish to demonstrate further the infelicity of these arms. The mercenary captains are either capable men, or they are not. If they are, you cannot trust them, because they always aspire to their own greatness, either by oppressing you, who are their master, or others contrary to your intentions. But if the captain is not skilful, you are ruined in the usual way. And if it be urged that whoever is armed will act in the same way, whether mercenary or not, I reply that when arms have to be resorted to, either by a prince or a republic, then the prince ought to go in person and perform the duty of a captain. The republic has to send its citizens, and when one is sent who does not turn out satisfactorily, it ought to recall him, and when one is worthy, to hold him by the laws so that he does not leave the command. And experience has shown princes and republics single-handed making the greatest progress and mercenaries doing nothing except damage. And it is more difficult to bring a republic, armed with its own arms, under the sway of one of its citizens, than it is to bring one armed with foreign arms. Rome and Sparta stood for many ages, armed and free. The Switzers are completely armed and quite free. Of ancient mercenaries, for example, there are the Carthaginians, who were oppressed by their mercenary soldiers after the first war with the Romans although the Carthaginians had their own citizens for captains. After the death of Epaminondas, Philip of Macedon was made captain of their soldiers by the Thebans, and after victory he took away their liberty. Duke Filippo being dead, the Milanese enlisted Francesco Sforza against the Venetians, and he, having overcome the enemy at Caravaggio, allied himself with them to crush the Milanese, his masters. His father, Sforza, having been engaged by Queen Joanna of Naples, left her unprotected, so that she was forced to throw herself into the arms of the King of Aragon in order to save her kingdom. And if the Venetians and Florentines formerly extended their dominions by these arms, and yet their captains did not make themselves princes, but have defended them, I reply that the Florentines, in this case, have been favoured by chance. For of the able captains, of whom they might have stood in fear, some have not conquered, some have been opposed, and others have turned their ambitions elsewhere. One who did not conquer was Giovanni Acuto, and since he did not conquer, his fidelity cannot be proved. But every one will acknowledge that had he conquered, the Florentines would have stood at his discretion. Sforza had the Braceschi always against him, so they watched each other. Francesco turned his ambition to Lombardy, Braccio, against the church and the kingdom of Naples. But let us come to that which happened a short while ago. The Florentines appointed as their captain Pagolo Vitelli, a most prudent man, who from a private position had risen to the greatest renown. If this man had taken Pisa, nobody can deny that it would have been proper for the Florentines to keep in with him, for if he became the soldier of their enemies, they had no means of resisting and if they hailed to him they must obey him. The Venetians, if their achievements are considered, will be seen to have acted safely and gloriously, so long as they sent to war their own men, when with armed gentlemen and plebeians they did valiantly. This was before they turned to enterprises on land, but when they began to fight on land they forsook this virtue, and followed the custom of Italy. And in the beginning of their expansion on land, through not having much territory, and because of their great reputation, they had not much to fear from their captains. But when they expanded, as under Carmignola, they had a taste of this mistake, for, having found him a most valiant man, they beat the Duke of Milan under his leadership, and, on the other hand, knowing how lukewarm he was in the war, they feared they would no longer conquer under him, and for this reason they were not willing nor were they able to let him go. And so, not to lose again that which they had acquired, 
they were compelled, in order to secure themselves, to murder him. They had afterwards for their captains Bartolomeo de Bergamo, Roberto de San Severino, the Count of Pitigliano, and the like, under whom they had to dread loss and not gain, as happened afterwards at Vila, where, in one battle, they lost that which in eight hundred years they had acquired with so much trouble. Because from such arms conquests come but slowly, long delayed and inconsiderable, but the losses sudden and portentous. And as with these examples I have reached Italy, which has been ruled for many years by mercenaries, I wish to discuss them more seriously, in order that, having seen their rise and progress, one may be better prepared to counteract them. You must understand that the Empire has recently come to be repudiated in Italy, that the Pope has acquired more temporal power, and that Italy has been divided into more states, for the reason that many of these great cities took up arms against their nobles who, formerly favoured by the Emperor, were oppressing them, whilst the Church was favouring them so as to gain authority and temporal power. In many others their citizens became princes. From this it came to pass that Italy fell partly into the hands of the Church and of republics, and, the Church consisting of priests and the republic of citizens unaccustomed to arms, both commenced to enlist foreigners. The first who gave renown to this soldiery was Alberigio de Conio, the Romanian. From the school of this man sprang, among others, Braccio and Sforza, who in their own time were the arbiters of Italy. After these came all the other captains who till now have directed the arms of Italy. And the end of all their valour has been that she has been overrun by Charles, robbed by Louis, ravaged by Ferdinand, and insulted by the Switzers. The principle that has guided them has been, first, to lower the credit of infantry so that they might increase their own. They did this because, subsisting on their pay and without territory, they were unable to support many soldiers, and a few infantry did not give them any authority. So they were led to employ cavalry, with a moderate force of which they were maintained and honoured. And affairs were brought to such a pass that in an army of twenty thousand soldiers there were not to be found two thousand foot-soldiers. They had, besides this, used every art to lessen fatigue and danger to themselves and their soldiers, not killing in the fray, but taking prisoners and liberating without ransom. They did not attack towns at night, nor did the garrisons of the towns attack encampments at night. They did not surround the camp either with stockade or ditch, nor did they campaign in the winter. All these things were permitted by their military rules, and devised by them to avoid, as I have said, both fatigue and dangers. Thus they have brought Italy to slavery and contempt. End of part four.